in the examples we have seen so far, we always ended up with one specific validator, a Haskell value of type validator. And if there was any variability in the contract, like in the vesting example, the beneficiary and the deadline, we modeled that by using the datum. So the datum contained the beneficiary and the deadline. However, there's an alternative that I want to talk about now that leads us to so-called parameterized contracts or parameterized scripts. So the idea is to bake variability into the contract itself. So in our case, in our example, instead of putting beneficiary and deadline into the datum, we could directly hard code them, so to speak, into the contract. Another way to look at it is to, instead of just creating one specific smart contract or one specific script, we create a family of scripts. And that family can be initialized for specific values of the parameters. So I made a copy of the vesting contract we looked at before and want to modify it now to instead use a parameterized contract. So first of all, I'll change vesting datum to vesting params because it no longer will be used as datum. Then we also don't need this instance any longer. Now the signature changes. We have an additional parameter, the parameter of the contract. In this example, it's only one. So we have one parameter for our contract, but that can be arbitrarily many. For example, instead of using this vesting params record type, I could also simply use two parameters, one of type pub key hash and one of type POSIX time. So seeing as beneficiary and deadline are now in the parameter, I don't need them in the datum any longer, so I can use unit for the datum. And then I, of course, must make appropriate changes here. So I have an additional parameter, and this one is just unit. And now the beneficiary can no longer be found in the datum. Now it's found in the parameters and the same for deadline. So this looks fine again. Now, of course, we also have to change that here because now we also have this additional parameter. So we could do it like this. I also can write that in so-called point free style like this. However, I need to import the dot in this case, the function composition in Haskell. Now for the validator, we obviously have to do something here as well. So instead of just a single value, we now expect a function from parameter to validator, a family of validators. And now, what do we do here? I mean, this obviously, as is, won't work because MacValidator script expects something of type compiled code of built-in data to built-in data to built-in data to unit. And now we have this additional parameter. So the obvious idea or naive idea would be to put the P in here at the right spot. And incidentally, now at least the Haskell plug in in this editor doesn't complain anymore. I also, of course, have to change this. This is now no longer just a simple IO action. I also have to give the parameters, write it point free like this. But now everything looks fine. And even if I build, it just compiles, which is a bit strange because there is an error in there now that has to do with template Haskell. But for some reason, during compilation, we don't detect that. I think that might be related to the GHC options that we specified in the Cabal file in order to make the editor plugin work nicer. But in any case, so, so it looks as if we are done and now we have our parameterized validator. However, let's see what happens if I actually want to try it. If I want to call this save file function. I set overloaded strings extension again. 
so that I can specify a pub key hash just as a string. This is an example pub key hash, and now some POSIX time, but it doesn't matter. I can just take an arbitrary number and let's see what happens. And we do get an error message. So we get an error reference to a name which is not a local, a built in or an external inlineable function, variable p. So it doesn't work, even though the Haskell compiles just fine. But when we actually execute it, and when we actually want to look at the compiled Pluto script or the CBOR hex of the compiled Pluto script, the serialized form that this function tries to produce, we get this error. And that has to do with template Haskell. So what's the problem? Well, the way template Haskell works is it's basically a pre-compilation step. So before the program is compiled, these template Haskell splices are spliced into the source code. So it is as if it's metaprogramming. So some code is executed that results in code and this code is spliced into the rest of the source code. And then that rest of the source code with the splices filled in is compiled in the usual way. In particular, that means that all the data that the template Haskell splices need must be known at compile time because this step runs before our program is even compiled or when it is compiled. But this P, this parameter, this testing parameter, this is only known at runtime. I mean, you could imagine that you have some sort of D app where you can specify vestings and the user provides beneficiary and the deadline, and then we want to do this. So at the time the program is written, we don't know the pub key hash and the deadline that we want to apply it to. So this is not known at compile time. And therefore, template Haskell obviously can't work. It doesn't know what code to generate and splice into the source code at this point. So even though this looks correct and the types seem to match, it can't possibly work. So what's the situation? On the Haskell side, we have our make validator function and we have the p of type vesting param and we could apply the one to the other um, like this and that would have the right type now on the pluto's core side we can compile this because make validator is known at compile time and I don't know how to write this. Let's, for example, put it into angular brackets to indicate that this is compiled, compiled to Pluto's core version of the Haskell function make validator. And I want this. I want make validator p compiled. But I can't apply compile here because the p is not known at compile time, so template Haskell won't work for p. So I can't do that. So now the idea is, in Plutus, this angular brackets make validator is also a function. It's not a Haskell function anymore, it's a Plutus core function, but a function nevertheless that you can apply to arguments. So if I could get my hands on the compiled version of p, then what I could do, I can't do this here directly, but then I can simply apply the make validator compiled. And actually that is called apply code in Plutus code to P. That would then be what I want. That would be the same as this. But this looks as if it doesn't solve anything because we still need a compiled version of P. And we have the same problem that P is not known at compile time, but only at runtime. However, P is not some arbitrary Haskell code, it's data. So it doesn't contain any function types. And as we will see for such types, there is a way if we make the type of p an instance of a type class called lift that's called lift code 
that does work at runtime. So using lift code, we can compile p at runtime to Pluto's core. And then using apply code, we can apply this function, this Pluto's core function to this Pluto's core value to get this, which is exactly what we want. Let's briefly look at the lift class. <clears throat> it has one method lift, but we won't use that method directly. As I mentioned before, we will use something called lift code. But lift code is available for types A that implement this lift class. And we see there's a bunch of instances for it. Uh, we can ignore this uni type parameter here. But we see it's all for data. It's characters, byte strings, integers, booleans, unit, data. I don't actually know what square root does. Um, lists of things that have an instance, maybe ratio and so on, either pairs, maps, triples, quadruples, quintuples, but no functions. And that's the reason why we can't use lift code all the time, not for compiling Haskell validators to Pluto's core validators, but we can use it for these data-like types that are similar to the data type that we use to express our datum and redeemers and the script context. So for those sort of types that are data-like and not function-like, instances for the lift class are available, and then we can use lift code. So have, let's have a brief look at lift code. We can ignore these, the second and the third precondition here. So if we have lift of A, then we have a function from A to compile code of A. And that's exactly what we need. So if we go back to the code, this won't work, but we can try it in a different way. Like so. Now, those are not in scope. And now we have a second problem, namely that we don't have an instance of the lift class. So I just told you that we do have instances of the lift class for data-like types, byte string, integers, booleans, and so on. But our P is of type vesting param, which of course is a type V created. So there is obviously no pre-made instance for that. However, similar as for the to data and from data classes, we also have some template Haskell mechanism that allows us to implement lift for our own types. We have to enable another extension and yet another one, multi-param type classes. And now this seems to be fine. And we see here, we also don't get any errors displayed anymore. Of course, that doesn't prove anything because we were in the same situation earlier, but we can try this out in the REPL now. Let's reload and try the same example again. And now it actually worked. And we do get a script here. So this is how parameterized contracts work. As I mentioned before, you can have more than one parameter, in which case you would have to chain several apply codes here. So apply one of the parameters after the other and you need to use lift code to lift those parameters into Pluto's core. And this is again one of these things where you in principle can just copy paste. So if you have one example of a parameterized script, you can apply this pattern to all such examples. I think it's a bit of an art to decide when you want parameterized contracts and when you rather would put the parameters in the datum instead. And there are some trade-offs here. So in the original version where it was in the datum, we had one script address. So all instances of vesting would be UTXOs sitting at the 
same script address. So in particular, that means they are easily discoverable. So you can just look at that one script address and all the UTXOs that participate in this vesting scheme would be found at that one address. On the other hand, if you use it like this, for each choice of the parameters, for each choice of beneficiary and deadline, we get a completely different script with a completely different script hash and therefore a completely different address. So for somebody to discover vestings, he would need to know the beneficiary and the deadline in order to be able to compute the hash and then look at the right address. Probably in this specific example, the best would be to do something half-half. Maybe use the beneficiary as a parameter to the contract, but put the deadline into the datum. And incidentally, I'll ask you in the homework to do just that. And the consequence of that would be that we would get one script per beneficiary, but for one specific beneficiary, we would have one script address and all the different vestings for that specific beneficiary for various deadlines would all sit at the same address. So it would be easy for specific beneficiary to find all the outstanding vestings for him. He could compute the script errors corresponding to his own pub key hash and then look on the blockchain for this address and discover all the vestings that are placed for him there. If we go with this as I have it here, then the beneficiary would need to know the dates, the deadlines in order to actually find the vestings that are on the blockchain. In the original scheme, without parameter, where the beneficiary is also in the datum, there might be the disadvantage that, depending on how many parties make use of this script, there might be thousands of such UTXOs on the blockchain. So to find a specific one, specific for specific beneficiary, for example, you would first need to look at all those UTXOs and then filter out those with the datum that you are interested in.